So welcome everyone this evening to today's Rewilding Network webinar event. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Sarah King and I'm Rewilding Network lead at Rewilding Britain. Uh, if anyone is interested in joining the network, um, we can share a link with you after this um, to provide some more information. But today we're going to be listening to two projects who are rewilding at smaller scales in Devon. So we welcome Kate Morley from Hillcrest, who's going to start off by talking about her project. Then we're going to bring in Laura Fairs, who's going to be talking about the Embercombe rewilding project. And finally, we're going to then talk about the Landscape Scale Initiative of Devon Wildland and how the two projects are connecting up at the landscape scale. You'll see that this has been set up as a Zoom meeting, so there will be time at the end for questions. If you have any questions at the end, you can post them in the chat and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, if you can stay on mute during the presentations and also put your video off during the presentations, that would be fantastic. And then we'll come together at the end um, for any questions that you have for Kate and Laura. So without further ado, I will start sharing my screen and uh, we can start making a start. So, you while I just hand there we go. Call over to Kate. Great stuff. Well, thanks, Sarah, for having us. It's great to be here. And thank you for everybody else for taking up the time of their evening to come along. It's always good to see people, um, especially on a bit of a wild and windy night. Um, thanks also, Sarah, for um, engaging with the topic about uh, small scale, because that's been one of the things we've been talking about. I've probably been nagging you over the years about sort of concentrating a bit on the smaller scale, because often the the bigger scale um, projects get an awful lot of uh, focus, obviously, because it's very exciting what's happening there. But sometimes people can feel it's a little bit um, alien to them if they've got a smaller, smaller site. So hopefully we'll share some insights tonight and um, maybe hopefully send some inspiration. But um, I guess probably um, I might just forward my slide a bit. Hopefully that's going to work. Let's try it again. Try it now, Kate. There we go. Takes a bit of time. Um, so basically, we're we're um, based outside of Exeter. We're three miles outside of Exeter, and we're three miles from Dartmoor National Park boundary. So we don't sit within a national park, which is sometimes quite handy, uh, because obviously the stuff you can do within the park is a, a bit more restricted. Um, what's a bit interesting about our site is that uh, it's been in my family for a long time, which I'll talk about in a second. But what I really, really love about rewilding um, is the fact that um, it's a complexity science. I'm a scientist by background, um, but uh, as I say, my family have been here for over 100 years, so I have a really strong connection to the land. Um, and I often feel it when I started this journey that I found it quite difficult to talk about sort of the more spiritual aspects and the sort of the, I guess, the airy fairy aspects of land. And um, I found I had to sort of frame everything in a very scientific way. Um, but I discovered a wonderful book, which I recommend everybody read. Uh, by a wonderful person called Robin Moore Kimmerer uh, called Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's been a really inspirational book for me because it talks about the science. Um, and she is um, a, a Native American and she um, talks about, she wanted to find out when she started on her journey, why two plants looked pretty next to each other. And she went to study that um, at Botany and they said, right, clear off and go and think about framing that differently. We don't do science like that here. And, and that's basically... Um, you know, the the attitude we find is this sort of this sort of either or. And what I try and do is try and just look at everything as, you know, it's a melting pot, really. And I find it really, really exciting because of that, because it's not only bringing in the science. I also think it brings in what we call the naturalized knowledge. And what I mean by that is this connection and understanding of the land. Obviously, in this country, we have an issue with talking about indigenous for very many good reasons. But I do think there's a real sort of value to understand understanding the land and where it's come from and your place within it and that's what I call naturalized knowledge and it's um it's critical really and it's often a sort of an argument against rewilding is that we sort of get caught up in the science but actually there's an awful lot to be said for for local knowledge and I think probably that came about sort of certainly with COVID that people got a lot better at knowing their local area and they got sort of sort of that knowledge back again. So whether that will be a legacy, I, I don't know. Um, so as a scientist, I sort of look at it and I kind of think, well, actually, what, when you look at a lot of these papers which are written in America or Europe, 
obviously they have a much much more space and the biggest problem we have in the uk is the fact that we are an island and that we don't have dogger land anymore which was this land bridge which which connected us to the mainland so anything which we do in this country will be always far more driven by humans um, and so, for instance, if we're looking at species reintroductions, when we see things like wolves um, doing really, really well on the continent, obviously they can't swim or catch the Eurostar, but, you know, it's that that's always going to be an issue. And I find, yes, it's frustrating, but also it gives us a huge opportunity to look at actually saying, rather than us all doing the same thing, or all doing micro nets, or all trying to do the same sort of style of rewilding, we can all do things quite differently and perhaps learn from other people's mistakes. And I'm sure probably people tonight will watch this presentation and think we're making some mistakes. But um, I really do think it's, um, it's a, a really interesting one. And certainly um, with... Um, with rewilding, what what is I personally see it as a, what what we call reciprocity. So this giving back to nature and nature giving back to humans. So I tend to talk about it in those senses. But if we look at sort of rewilding about human, you know, human enabled and nature led. So that's what we're looking at. And this is a really good, um, uh, I think, visualization of this. It's on a content, you know, continuum. Things are moving. They're flux. It's never really going to be um, a, a static system. And where are we in, in this case in, in Hillcrest? Well, you can see I kind of think we're on that red red arrow coming in there. So we're, we, if you look at the history of the land, which I think is really important to know about, is that this, this farm uh, was, was a dairy farm. My, um, my grandmother, great-grandmother was um, widowed here, but she kept a dairy farm here. And... We also were very um, important within the war effort. So, so we had sheep farming, we buried, buried asbestos um, when they built the A30. We had all of the spoil dumped here um, and we were flailing and we were applying an annual chemicals. And we did that because that's what we thought we should do. And I think sometimes in life you have to say, actually, where have you come from? And certainly from my background, people come probably look at me and say, well, actually, I'm a nature lover and that's where I've always been. But actually, my my background is very right wing. Um, I used to be very pro hunting. Um, I used to think pheasants were native. Um, I thought Dartmoor looked completely natural. And then, um, you know, and I have to sort of hold my hand up and say, you know, that was my background. And and to say how far I've come from that and, and the understanding, that obviously, pheasants aren't native. Um, and the fact that they do huge amounts of damage to the local environment with the fact that they hoover up everything. But, you know, you have to say that, that was my starting point. And when I speak to farmers around here and I can understand where they're coming from because that's their knowledge and that's what they've been brought up with. And then bizarrely, I, I met this strange chap who was um, a uh, was in wolf conservation and he uh, ran a charity or runs a charity called Wolves and Humans Foundation. And I started to listen to him and we'd, we'd talk and sit on Dartmoor and say, look at this, it's a, it's a barren wasteland. And I'd be like, well, there's nothing, it's beautiful, it's wild. And when you actually suddenly have those blinkers taken off, it's a very hard lesson. And, um, and that's effectively what happens here on this land. And you have to look at the legacy. I find it extremely hard to move away from, from that legacy. Um, my grandfather in the middle there hated trees. Um, my great grandmother there, you know, she she kept the place going. And when I see that 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 picture on the right hand side of my uncle Bill, who spent hours and hours controlling the land, um, it, I often look at that picture and feel quite sad that I've let it go. And that was a huge um, journey that I had to go on. And often I go for a walk now at certain times of the year and find it very hard to see that that lack of control really and i think that's really what rewilding brings to the land or a wild landscape brings is is sort of having your hands off and saying actually let's have a bit more nature so um so we were small holders we have 16 acres here but we were tenant farmers of the surrounding areas as well um my great grandmother said 100 years ago there's no future in farming go and get a trade so that's what we've all done um, and the fact that 16 acres or what we were farming then probably was about 100 acres 
uh, wasn't big enough. Now, if I talk to local farmers now, they talk about 500 acres not being big enough to be economically viable. So it does make you wonder when and where we're going to stop with this sort of intensification. So you can see the holding there on the left hand side. Um, and um, on the right hand side is a picture just taken after the war It's quite an interesting picture because you can see the, the craters which the bombs left as they came out of Exeter and dropped them. Uh, but what you can also see in this picture is the huge amount of change within the landscape and the fact that actually we've lost a lot of um, hedgerows. And it, it's quite interesting to see the change. And we kind of look at the landscape now and see this green and pleasant land. And that was where we were when we started. Um, so you can see the land was scraped off when we took the uh, spoil from the A30 out. Um, but what's quite interesting is after this picture, we had a huge amount of wildflowers come back and people said, oh, look at your amazing species rich grassland. So when we started planting trees, people sort of said, oh, my goodness, you've planted trees on, on species rich grassland. But actually, it was only a very, very short period of time that we had that. What you can also see is the fact that we're a very steep site. And I think it's also important to note that we had three fatalities within this parish. Um, from tractors rolling. So that was another decision which I decided I, I did my tractor ticket and I didn't feel confident that I could drive a tractor on this land. So it's constantly battling the um, typography um, and we kind of said, actually, let's make a change. And the biggest change happened when we had a huge landslip and the landslip occurred. You can see there that the bottom, you can see a right hand, a right hand side on that picture, there's a conifer and that slipped all the way down and that's our neighbor's land slipped into ours so we couldn't gain access to it and this time my grandfather who was 97 was in a nursing home and um, that meant we couldn't access the land and it started to scrub up now the problem came when he died two years after he died we had um, when he'd gone into the care home he'd been assessed for care home fees and the single farm payment RPA was taken into the assessment for his care home. And we stupidly at the time didn't say, hang on a minute, that money's there for the land. They took the money, so they took it from the RPA, took it into the health department to, to the care home. Um, so we never saw the money. Then two years after he died, they did this aerial um, survey and said, actually, this is scrubbing up. We want thousands and thousands of pounds back. So we said, actually, we, we don't have that money. It went straight to care home fees. And also um, he's dead, you know, and probate had been finalized at that point. So they, we, they kept on and on and on and they went on for over a year. And in the end, we had to get a barrister involved to say, actually, this person is dead. And it, and they lost the death certificates. It was a right mess up, really. But, but that's the Rural Payments Agency. There's plenty of stories out there for you on that one. But what's quite interesting about that is that influenced greatly what I was prepared to do on the land because I said I want nothing to do with subsidies I'm sick to tired tired of it anything I do on this land will be from our our own pocket and it will be our own decision so that's possibly how we broke out of that cycle of, of relying on on the the subsidies so in 2012 we started planting trees and you can see the picture on on the side um, and um, so we planted trees we went for a mixture of different sort of uh, native trees um, and you can see it's growing quite quickly and um, and you can see another one there and we put in the tree guards and we've taken the tree guards off now and we we re, re, reuse the tree guards um, and we take them off depending upon when the species are actually at, uh, mature enough so we don't just leave tree guards on that's one of my pet hates is walking around a wood and seeing discarded tree guards we take them off and we've got a scheme going with Devon contract waste to uh, recycle them which is really great um, but we're actually reusing some of those tree guards in our next door neighbors land which we're just about to to plant up uh, we've got a huge amount of natural regen on the site um, so we've got probably about 30% natural regen. And what you can see happening here is that the brambles are moving out as those oaks are growing up. The bramble moves and you see that it shades out the brambles as it moves. So, um, um, but what we also do as well is um, we have a huge amount of deer here. We have roe, which is sort of resident. We have fallow, which come across from Holden. We have red deer occasionally coming through and we've now just had muntjac come through. So that is why we made the decision to, to A, use tree guards and B, do some planting. 
Um, we've also got the issue um, with when I talk about regen, uh, I would think it's really important, especially if you're a smaller site, to look at your boundaries, because with your boundaries, compared to the land space you've got, is hugely influential. At the moment, we've got neighbours which um, have got beautiful Japanese garden, um, but they've got skank cabbage in. Um, and they've got laurel in, which I had left that area, hadn't been down there. And as we saw at Regen, it, that's coming over. So we've been controlling that because obviously it's, it's great to look at natural region and that's the preferable uh, way of doing it. But obviously you have to be always very mindful about what is regenerating behind, really. Um, and also we have a lot of squirrels as well, which we, I'll be honest, we have been controlling the numbers of squirrels because supposedly they will only ring bark once they get to a, a certain um certain number so we do control squirrels and um, when I say that we we live trap them and then um, I check them every three hours um, and then we leave the the squirrels we use um, a lead free shot um, so what, what's quite interesting this picture is not meant to be a gruesome picture it's quite an interesting picture because this is a squirrel turned completely inside out um, and we're not quite sure how what did it we believe it was probably a buzzard um, basically had pulled pulled it off and, and managed to turn it completely inside out, which was amazing to see that. Um, and also we have power lines coming across and I suspect probably lots of smaller sites have this issue that they have things which they can't necessarily allow to naturally regen underneath. Um, so you've always got to be mindful about that. But again, we've got pylons just down the, the, the valley. Again, I kind of think about what my great grandmother must have thought when she saw these pylons coming across. Did she see progress? And yippee, she's going to get a fantastic washing machine. Or did she think what an unsightly, um, you know, so it's that social good. And that's what I think we need to be thinking about, really, is that social need. And that's where we're at with this, you know, ecological and uh, climate crisis. You know, it's an emergency. Uh, so we have tracks right the way across the site. And that's brilliant for me because I feel as though I'm still working on the land, which does have a, a huge thing. It's edge habitat. You can see there we've got glow worms here, which is very exciting. And it's also allows the animals to move through the landscape. Um, and it allows my six year old daughter to go for a walk. because She won't go for a walk otherwise with sort of face full of brambles. Uh, it does actually keep the ticks down when you go for a walk and it allows or accessibility, which is important for our site, really. Um, so there are some challenges for smaller scales, and we've had a challenge in the fact that we've got dormice here. So obviously with rewilding um, principles, we would do very minimal management of that. And it's where there's sort of trade-off, really, because obviously we want to maintain dormice, um, but we had some really good advice here um, from a wonderful chap, um, he goes by the name of Raven Quest. And what he was saying is looking at coppicing differently. So when you're looking at coppicing on, on a rewilding site is you, you look at aerial walkways for, for dormice. Dormice don't like coming. I don't, you know, I've just learned all this, but basically they don't like coming down, down onto the ground. So it's always important to try and leave aerial walkways across, which we've done there. And also when we come to coppice this stool here, you'll see, you see the picture. The red line is probably where you would normally coppice. But what he's suggesting is you coppice a lot further up and um, also look for sort of, you can see all that yellow round there. You can see there's a little hidey hole, which was supposedly dormice will suddenly fall asleep. Um, and they um, just like little hidey holes. Um, so if you look for little, little sort of holes and try and maintain those as well. So rather than chopping the lot, thinking about those the impacts on those species, really. Um, the other thing with small scale, and I think generally within rewilding, we're puzzling over at the moment is the necrobiome, which is sort of the how we get some death into the landscape. And this is really important because um, with death and animals dying, those nutrients go back into the cycle. We had some brilliant footage of some a huge load of butterflies feeding on a dead carcass, which we brought in. I, I tend to pick up roadkill and bring it in. And it's all those nutrients which come back into the system. And I think these are always issues, policy issues, we're going to be needing to look at when we move towards more rewilding sites or wilder landscapes, is how we bring back some death because we've got used to tidying it all away. 
Um, and I think that's really important to be thinking about. And also the spillover effect about where these butterflies move to at these edge habitats or these butterflies, which are very specific. We can't micromanage this. That's where we, we've been. That's what we've done with conservation. So while we're looking at sort of larger scale, you've got to say, actually, what's going to happen to these important species? Are we going to lose them by allowing it to scrub up? So I think that's, um, you know, always important to be thinking about that spillover effect, what's happening on your neighbor's land. And for me, the biggest challenge on this land with rewilding has been the attitudes which we've encountered. Being a smaller site means that you're far more under scrutiny from your neighbours. Neighbours can see what you're up to. And um, we, we've had neighbours say, excuse the language, you're not effing country, despite the fact we've lived here for five generations now. But because we've started doing something different, they felt quite challenged by that. Um, we've had ecologists say, oh, no, you've planted on species rich grasslands. So um, and it's this whole yeah, but yeah, but what about this? What about that? And for me, it's the bystander effect where people feel that somebody else is going to do it. And sometimes you have to make the decision to get off your hands and actually do it. And I think there's a huge thing is that when we the same person who said you're not effing country, as soon as we started putting the trees in with tree guards, so ah, you know what you're doing. You've got you've got a plan. So there is that element of actually making sure that making an intention um, can actually be quite quite um, important. So just a couple more slides from me. Um, I kind of think of it like rebooting the baseline, and obviously, probably most people here tonight will, will understand the whole theory about shifting baseline. Um, this whole theory about what you see in the landscape is what you you expect to see. So hopefully we're changing people's perception. And what's really exciting is that our neighbour is now coming on board and, and we're going to be doing the same on, on his land. So we're taking up, hopefully going to be working with him to do that. So that's really exciting. Um, so that's sort of coming up beginning of December. So that's really good. Um, it helps mitigate my eco anxiety. So I read all this horrible stuff out there in the real world, but I can at least feel that I'm making a change here. I expect Laura will cover this in a minute, but it's sort of the logistics of how we get that disturbance, how we get the poo. We need more, more poo. Um, and that's really, really critical. And I think within the um, current sort of policies of how we move animals and stuff, that's really, really a tricky one, which is why Laura's along because she's the expert on that and um, hopefully we're making progress there um it's also about making money we do need to make money and we have a holiday let and i would say if everyone anyone's got a rewilding site and they're thinking about getting involved it's not everyone's cup of tea and also choose your agent wisely really we chose a very mainstream agent because most of our guests go out off site and go and enjoy places like dawlish warren and things which works well for us because Frankly, we don't want too much human disturbance on the on the land. Um, and um, also, it's exciting to see people reading a daily mail <laughs> and then saying, gosh, I get what you're doing. You know, it's great. I'm going to start doing this at home because those are the people we need to be winning over, not the people which we know are on board already. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people who are professionals, perhaps they're GPs or they are solicitors. They have land and they're just doing the same old thing because that's what they feel they should do. And that's really those people I feel we should, we're talking to at the moment is actually saying, look, there is alternative ways of, of having the land. Um, I do some nature therapy here. I'm, I'm lucky that my background is working for the NHS and in private health care. So I'm sort of translating that onto the land. Um, and I think it's very exciting to see more of this nature tokenization coming on, how we can, a bit like um, NFTs, where you can sell sort of digital products, you can sell nature to, to companies which will have that direct link. My only caution with that is if the wrong people get involved, there is a sort of cowboy possibly going to come along. But, you know, quite frankly, I think we need to be stepping up to the plate and starting to work together with, with that rather than turning our backs on it. Um, this is brilliant Marchant. Marchant there um, is an incredible poet. He wrote this poet for us and we were very lucky that um, uh, he we worked with more trees. A wonderful charity came along and helped us plant 4,500 trees here. And it was an amazing experience. 
wonderful to see what people got out of planting trees. And this is March, and, and this this um, poem for us sums up what we're doing here. We're awaking a woodland. This is a step on our journey. We are, you know, if you said, oh, are we rewilding? Are we doing woodland creation? At the moment, we're on woodland creation, but it's this next step, which is exciting. And this is really, you know, how we get these dynamic processes kick-started again. How do we get these animals in to drive those processes? I know rewilding gets criticized for being re-farming at the moment when we're looking at, you know, how we get those processes, but we're trying to work out how we can do that within the framework of what we've got and what we can use and how we can move these animals. So I think we're now over to you, Laura. Thanks, Kate. I'll just um, pass control over to Laura. Thanks, Kate. Being introduced as the poo expert, what <laughs> higher accolades could I have asked for? <laughs> you should have um, control now Laura thank you thanks Sarah um thanks Kate for that wonderful um having been to Hillcrest um that's like a whirlwind virtual tour of Kate's rewilding site so thank you Kate um yeah thanks thanks yeah thanks for me as well for inviting me along um and I'm just going to very briefly whiz through a bit of information about Embercoombe before we talk about uh, the Devon Wildland, which is a which is a sort of initiative that Kate and I are working on together. So, um, so I work for um, at a place called Embercombe. I'm just going to see if I can done it for you. Okay. Um, and yeah, Embercombe is um, a residential um, education retreat where we run courses and programs very close to the land um, with nature and um, it was let's see if my real broadband can catch up with the slides Yeah, so we're 50 acres and we're right on the edge of Dartmoor. This photo in the in the distance, um, that's Dartmoor up on the horizon. And the site is a combination of, um, there's a woodland, a deciduous woodland, some areas of grassland. We have a lake, orchards, agroforestry area. We've got accommodation for people who come on the courses, our main operational centre, as well as camping spaces, um, a stone circle well and all sorts of other um, little nooks and crannies that we use for our courses and programs. So essentially we are um, somewhere where people come to have retreats or um, have education experiences, land-based learning. So that's fundamentally um, where, we, where we start from with our rewilding project. And Embercoon was founded um, just over 20 years ago. And although this isn't a photo of the land, this is um, what it looked like when it was founded. We had the large area of woodland that we still have now, but all of the grassland was heavily grazed by sheep and ponies. And so looked very much like this. And the buildings were some old aircraft hangars that the previous owner had built his own contraptions in. So this is a picture probably about 15 years ago, we think. Um, this is an aerial photograph in the old days when someone used to have to fly over in an aeroplane. Um, and this, I included this photo because it shows that many, many hands and many groups of people and different um, apprentices and teams of staff and um, young offenders and all sorts of college groups used to come to the land and went about setting up what the original intention was to be a farm. And this aerial photograph shows some of the hedges um, and fence lines that were planted over or have been planted over the first 10 to 15 years of Embercoombe being founded. And you can see just at the bottom um, was one of the growing areas. And also just on the right at the bottom is the stone circle in its very early days. And um, yeah, there was a large agroforestry area where we produce food and people came to the land in an apprenticeship, learned to become a grower or support grower, learned how to cook the food and all our courses and programmes were provided for with the food that we grew on the land. 
and there was a lot of land-based learning going on as say in all sorts of different groups of people coming onto the land and, and planting trees and developing the field system that we have now and I mentioned this really um, for a couple of reasons one is because I'm about to talk about where we decided to turn away from that process but also really even long before we decided to rewild, um, many hands were planting trees and bushes and developing areas for wildlife before we were calling it rewilding. So we are left with a particularly spectacular mosaic of small field systems surrounded by hedgerows, thanks to all of that, that work that went on in the early days. So in 2007, Embercoon took a decision to turn away from food production and we started to move to a place where we stopped seeing the site as somewhere where we could consume the products of the land for humans and decided to take a rewilding approach where it was appropriate where we could but we do still obviously have accommodation on the site so um, we are not um, I, I always say we are using rewilding principles to our management uh, rather than a true rewilding estate in the sense of coming in the gates and being immediately in a wildland. So this decision was taken to honour all of the past work that had come before. As I say, thousands of trees have been planted, um, but also starting to step back and invite the wild back into the space that we share. So in... Um, over those few years between 2017 and 2020, um, much of the land set about rewilding itself. There was still quite a lot of sheep on the land, but the food production stopped and the many people sort of um, tilling the land was removed. So the land started to rewild itself. I joined Embercoom in 2020 and um, set about really trying to apply some of these rewilding principles uh, more actively rather than just passively um, not doing anything with the land. So we've dramatically reduced the sheep numbers. We've got three of the grandmothers left that um, the team didn't feel comfortable just slaughtering after their many years of service. So we have three Shetland sheep that are going to live out their days on the land, which at the moment is fine because we don't have any other livestock there consistently. We've ceased hay cutting. And I began to set about um, monitoring, setting up as many different forms of monitoring on the land as I could. Much of that is done with volunteers. And really, um, it's quite incredible what's happened at Embercombe. It's absolutely burst into life. And um, I go there all the time and it feels normal to me, but a lot of people come to the land and it's actually the first time that they have the opportunity to see what land looks like when it is allowed to pulse and so we have great structural diversity we've got all sorts of um, plants and what people would call weeds coming up particularly in our growing area where the land has been disturbed and these are often the places that are the most abundant um, in butterflies and moths and all the spiders we've got a fantastic reptile population which we're monitoring now um, and all sorts of other animals and plants um, are emerging. And when you walk on the land in summer, it really does feel like it's absolutely alive with bioabundance. We may not have anything particularly rare, but is an opportunity to challenge some of these shifting baselines that Kate was talking about, where we can be in a piece of wild space where you really are surrounded by masses of invertebrates, butterflies, plants of all different types, seeds, flowers, nuts, berries. So it really is um, an incredible thing to witness. So this is one of our orchards and you can see the um, grasses and some of the docks and thistles growing. So this is the area that I showed you with all the vegetables growing. This is the same area taken from a slightly different angle, but this is what it looks like now. So um, we're really just getting started and um, some of the actions we're taking are starting to remove some of the internal fencing. I have introduced some agents of change. We've had some pigs come and visit for a few months of the year 
And uh, Kate and I have been talking about this is something we hope to roll out across the wildland where we have a roving herd of pigs so that people with small scale rewilding sites who cannot um, have these types of um, yeah, agents of change or proxies on their land all of the time where we can start to link up and reintroduce these back and give small scale rewilders the opportunity to really practice some of this um, dynamic rewilding stuff without using machineries or fossil fuels. So this is something we're working on, a roving pig herd. And these are our, these are our beauties from last year. And they really are, um, yeah, and again, to some of the things that Kate referred to, we've had people telling us that they're making a mess and um, that how will you ever get back in and cut the hay? So that feels like a job done if we can't do that again. So, And we've got a lake on the site. So one of the big challenges we've got is that the lake was stocked with carp way back at the beginning of Embercombe with the intention that they would be used for food. And we now have a beautiful lake and a fantastic population of amphibians and dragonflies, but um, some very hungry and really large carp in the lake. So um, one of the challenges is whether we can remove those carp and take them out of the lake, but also balancing that with some of the other work we do at Embercombe about animism. And is it really fair to take those carp out of the lake? So we are also, within our rewilding is really trying to bring some of these challenges around the decisions that you make in your own lives, the decisions that we make on our rewilding sites and really inviting people into an exploration of some of these really complex issues, which on paper may be a case of, okay, we'll just get the carp out. Um, but in practice is both logistically, um, legally, um, practically difficult, but also bringing in some of the challenges around the spiritual part of this work, which is that um, how do we undo some of that work without harming the species that are living in the environment through no fault of their own. So one of the things that we've been or I've been thinking about and starting to talk to people about is replicating um, not just using pigs as a proxy, but also perhaps replicating something which would happen in the wild, which is that the carp would be um, predated on and much of their remains would be left on the land so one of the things I'm exploring is whether we could actually we could act as the proxies and remove the carp from the lake but then leave them out on the land to decay and return those nutrients back into a cycle on the land so part of the necrobiome but also really um, facing some of the challenges around how that makes us feel if we take those actions as well. Um, and yeah, the other final thing I just wanted to add is inviting people back onto the land um, and sharing the work that we're doing. Um, we run rewilding courses, we run rewilding experiences and inviting people to come in and really think about some of these questions about how we invite the wild back into our lives and what that looks like, not just at Embercombe, but when they leave Embercombe. Part of Embercombe's mission is to um, for people to come to Embercombe and experience whether it be rewilding or some of the other courses that we do, but then really um, enable them and feel to feel empowered to take that work out into their lives as well. So whether they live in a city or whether they live out somewhere where they can be out in meadows and woodlands is to really take that experience that they have at Embercombe, take some of those challenges and invitations to question um, about dismantling some of the things that remove us from the wild or make us so detached from that connection with nature. Um, yeah, and then finally, um, segueing into our Devon Wildland um, work is, yeah, taking Embercombe and connecting up with our neighbours so that we can work across the landscape. Thank you. I'm going to pass back to Kate now for an introduction to our Devon Wildland initiative. Yeah, I just thought I'd quickly mention that, that there's a third um, small scale rewilding, which we're going to talk about in a minute with, with Devon Wildland, which is Mamhead, which is Let Safari. And they're doing some really exciting work over on there, which is right on the other end of the Holden Ridge. They've got a, about just over 100 acres of land, which they are returning to um, nature. Uh, they run a sculpture park, um, so they bring art um, into the to the mix as well. And they run a subscription service. So um, and they do virtual reality tours so people can if they live in the city, they can actually 
um, pay a subscription and they get a sort of a virtual reality once a week, sort of a, a tour of a wild space to get that connection. Um, so um, if you check out, I've got their website at the end, go and check out their work because it's doing some exciting stuff. And again, you know, they've, they've got a capability brown garden, which is, you know, obviously very precious, but actually how they're bringing wildness back to that. So um, we're talking now about Devon Wildland. So that brings us all three of us back in together. So I was we were here in our 16 acres thinking, OK, this is all very great, but we've got this little island, a pocket of wildness. So how would we connect up? So it was really strange that as I was looking around and hearing this great work which was going on at Embercombe, and I also heard about the great work going on at Mamhead, I kind of thought, actually, how would we link it up? Now, obviously, with landscape scale um, rewilding or landscape scale um, restoration, you would normally go along a river um, valley, which obviously makes sense. But the point about Devon Wildland was actually to say, actually, rather than saying how easy this could be, is actually look at some of those challenges and barriers to wildlife and say, how would you overcome them? Um, and all these things we've put in the landscape, human made, which actually affect wildlife from moving. So uh, you can see, I'm not going to read those to you there, but basically it's um, a connection of people coming together to have an intention um, to make more space for nature. Um, and it's uh, going to be sort of based on the core um, principles of rewilding from the IUCN. So looking at core sites, so that's the three of us um, who are sort of doing more of a rewilding site. Um, but we're looking at the connectivity, not only sort of, um, you know, how would a pine martin get from here to Mamhead? And it's also those coexistence, those sort of talking about sort of... Um, carnivals I guess you would normally be talking about in this sense but actually how would we coexist with with new animals within the landscape and again and there we go back to that nature-led and human enabled again and um, it's not about dictating um, how people do things so, yeah, I've had so many people sit on the sidelines and say you should do this you should do that and quite frankly it's 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 mentally and em emotionally draining it's about looking at people, understanding some of these choices, like Laura says, they've got three sheep for a very good reason. Um, and yes, it's not ideal, but it's how you move forward from that and be sort of a, a sort of a, an interested party and say, actually, this is interesting and we can perhaps learn from each other. So when we talk to um, what we're at the process of doing at the moment is talking to intermediary sort of landowners in between. We're not saying, right, you must go for rewilding. We're talking about making more space for nature. So what we're doing, hopefully, with Sarah coming very soon, which is really exciting, is mapping this and looking for hot spots across the landscape, which saying, actually, you're going to carry on doing what you're doing with sort of heavy agricultural that's not ideal but we can work with it but this particular point in the landscape is really critical for linking and it's talking to those landowners and saying actually for this particular point can we look at doing some connection here so we've got the tree hub here so we're growing trees uh, local native trees so for instance if they want to create a, a fairly bushy scrubby hedgerow if you want to create woodland across the ridge we can provide you the trees to do so um, and as I say, it's not just rewilding, it's moving towards a wider landscape, going back to that original slide, that sort of that moving along the continuum, pushing people a little bit wilder, should we say. And that will be alongside things. At the moment, um, we um, are really excited that we've been talking to Forestry England. Now, across the Holden Ridge, if you're familiar with it, we have the Holden um, Forest Park. It's a um, forestry enterprise in the fact that it creates sort of it's, um, you know, we, we have timber coming out, but also it's hugely recreational. I think it's one of the most um, visited areas in the southwest. And we've been very excited to be talking to them about saying, actually, in your next management plan, can we at least look at these corridors? Can we say, actually, this area we need to be thinking about connecting up? So you've got there is the core areas, which obviously is, is again going to the IUCN. So it's actually saying actually connecting these core areas up um, and creating buffer zones, really. Um, and we, what we're saying is we're not being too prescriptive about this. And we're hoping that people will come on board doing this reciprocity idea, actually thinking differently about the landscape, changing the mindset and saying actually um, 
to give space to nature really on their land and to work collaboratively. We're not here to be, um, there's lots of people out there telling people what to do. There's a huge amount of advice you can get as a landowner, but it's actually having, bringing people in, bringing them to the table. And I really loved it when I saw Roy Dennis in the summer. And I guess most of you will know Roy, he's an incredibly inspirational person who spent his lifetime working on species reintroductions and a huge amount of work particularly with white-tailed eagles and ospreys. And he said, have a long-term vision, 100 years, and stick at it. And I think well, this is the slight issue we've had before with conservation is these short-term projects. Those people move on to the next one. There's no sort of record of what's happened, so people are constantly reinventing the wheel. So what we're trying to do with Devon Wildland is create a solid base for actually future work, really, so that we can say, this is what we're working towards collectively. This is what's happened before, some great projects. How do we build on those and how do we keep those relationships going? So those are our websites. And there you go, back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just gonna leave these up here for a little bit of time just in case anyone wants to note them down, but we will share them around afterwards as well. But thank you so much, Kate and Laura. There was a lot of information in there. Hopefully it's been really useful. I think they're too incredible inspirational projects that show that you can rewild at smaller scales um it's done in a slightly different way but there's been a, a result has been that nature's bouncing back in these in these pockets and i think through devon wildland to then connect up that through other land uses is incredibly exciting um so i'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can come back to the room and hopefully the chat's been filling up with some um questions but if you have any questions please drop them in the chat um now um, I'm just going to start off with one that I'd love to put to both of you, and you've kind of, um, I guess you've you've covered it slightly in, in your presentations, but we know that rewilding can be extremely challenging, and I was just wondering um, what your biggest challenge has you faced as part of your rewilding, and what advice you'd give to others who are maybe in a similar position. Um, God, where to start? I could just pick one. <laughs> Um, you right, can pick a couple. Yeah, I suppose um, from a practical point of view, my biggest challenge at Embercoom is that we have a well. I'm very we're very fortunate that 22 years ago um, somebody had the foresight to put a deer fence up around the outside of the um, perimeter. Uh, we have we're right next to Holden Forest, so there are herds of 80 to 120 deer walking along the road next to us so we our woodland is um beautifully um diverse um but unfortunately that fence is now falling down so from a practical point of view one of the biggest challenges i've got is getting the funding to replace that fence um and then to implement an invisible fence system within the site so that i can introduce these proxies um, and I need to do that because of the accommodation and the participants that come to the site. So we need to exclude the what we're calling our people zone where um, the main offices are and the accommodation villages. Um, but unfortunately, for a small site, um, yeah, those those sort of very practical challenges are looming large um, and the deer is starting to get in. And we've just had our woodland dedicate um, designated as a county wildlife site, which is is sort of the, if you like the lowest designation that you can get um, within the sort of nature reserve triple SI kind of hierarchy but it's still an acknowledgement that we do have a very special piece of woodland that has not been impacted by deer grazing so that's a very sort of practical challenge um, and I would say more of a logistical or thought-based um, challenge is yeah this this idea of sort of how do you rewild a small site with lots of people coming to visit where you need to think about health and safety and um yes how do you balance how do you balance rewilding principles against traditional management and also sort of amenity areas and how do you juggle all of those things in such a small space and how do you make these arbitrary decisions about what you call rewilding and what you don't so i, I would say and and my advice would be to people who've got those same challenges is um, try not to get too tied up in that conversation and just get on and do what feels right for you. If you've got a trackway and you want to lay the hedge along it, then don't worry that that's not technically rewilding because you would, in my experience, is part of the journey that you go along is actually discovering that he laying hedges is rewilding because it's a traditional practice that connects you to the land. 
and shows you how things are regenerating and, re and cycling through rebirth. And um, yeah, so actually when you start going down the road of all these questions, you find that everything is rewilding because it's making you think about how you're going to increase biodiversity for that site. So mm -hmm. try not to get too tied up on it. And as long as you've got a reason for doing it, then just get crack on and do it. So, Kate. Perfect. Yeah, I would just say um, have, have be determined because I think I would have so many times bottled it if I hadn't had Richard. He was absolutely determined what we were doing and have that sort of vision. You know, I would have just said, no, I can't do this. It's looking too scruffy. So, yeah, just stick at it. Great. Um, we've got a few questions, so I'll try and get through as many as I can today while we've got the time that we have left. Um, there's a question from Mark. He said he owns a 35 acre wood, uh, which is managed which is managed, but purely for biodiversity. It's a mixed woodland ranging from 20% Western hemlock planted in the 70s to mixed broadleaf and open coppice areas. I want to increase the biodiversity, but not sure how to do this. Any advice would be welcome. So I guess any advice um, on how Mark can maybe get some, some more advice or help with increasing the biodiversity of his woodland? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's loads of stuff out there, isn't there, uh, about how to do that in a woodland. Um, my advice would be, Mark, depending on where your base is to, um, yeah, take a scattergun approach, look on the internet, but also see if you can talk to people nearby who are doing the similar sort of work as to what you're trying to achieve. Maybe get in touch with local NGOs or farm, farm wild, wildlife advisory groups, whatever is near your patch, um, and see if there is someone Often some of the NGOs have project based staff who there might be funding available to come and give you some land advice or get in touch with a tree charity or the Woodland Trust or anything like anything like that. Just have a look around and see what's available. Um, but yeah, and equally, if there's someone nearby who's got a woodland, don't be shy of going introducing yourself and just saying that I'd really love some advice. Would you like to come? Would you have the time to come and look at my wood? Generally, most people like being nosy. And if you've got a bit of private land and you invite somebody in, they'd quite like to have a look. So that's always a good place to start. Yeah, I would say um, cherry pick. You know, I think the thing is, is not to always take one person's view as red, really, because often, dare I say it, the NGOs have been conditioned to think in a certain way. So often it's good to sort of cherry pick. And I guess on the Rewilding Britain um, website, there's also lots of resources there for taking that next step, really. But I would say just, you know, as well, sort of stick yourself into that land. In other words, take a bit of time rather than dashing and changing everything and doing everything at once. Take a bit of time to actually get to know that woodland. Um, so when people come and offer you advice and think about how that will work with you and how that will work with your lifestyle as well, you know, what what, what your time constraints are and things like that. Don't be afraid to test things out, even if it's in small areas. Mm. A little bit of empathy. Sorry, Laura. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, sprinkle a little bit of empathy advice as well as um, go and sit in your woodland and ask it what it wants. Mm -hmm. and see if it gives you the answer. Yeah. OK. Um, a question from Pete. It's specifically for you, Laura, but Kate, you might be able to advise on this as well for your site. Um, can you talk a little bit about what monitoring you're doing? Um, just a real, really quick overview of what you monitor and who does the monitoring. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so thanks, Pete. Um, I, what I didn't, just because we're a bit short of time, what I didn't say is my background is um, I've been working in nature conservation for 25 years um, before I came to Embercoom. So um, I had I had some knowledge about um, monitoring already, but I have very little resources. So what I did is I have so far I've set up the ones that I can for very little money. Um, so I'm doing a butterfly transect, dragonfly monitoring, reptile tins. Um, I had somebody come in and do a plant survey. That was one bit of money that I did manage to get. So I've got an entire plants list of the whole site. Um, we've gone out with bat detectors with very little knowledge and just really just looking for the, for the common species. Um, we've done some pond dipping, just literally bringing children in and monitoring what's in there when we can. And I'm very lucky to have a very um, expert moth expert in our local patch who loves going out onto other people's land so he's been doing monthly moth monitoring as well so most of it is done by volunteers I have volunteers come in and do the butterfly transect and check the reptile tins and all I did was set up a route and I've just cut some hazel poles and painted the tops and those are the poles to mark where the transects are and where the tins are and I picked up some corrugated iron from somebody corrugated sheets from somebody whose stable fell down paid them 50 quid for 20 sheets and cut them up with an angle grinder and put them around the site. So 
it's all really quite basic stuff that I'm doing with a huge aspiration to do more. I've just built some hedgehog tunnels and a volunteer is going to come in and set those up for me next season. So that'll be the next slot. And I'd love to engage with the Devon Mammal Group and see if they can come out and put some dormice boxes up. So it's really been just to try and do as much as I can, as, as when I can with what I can. So, but picking those key species that people regularly monitor and that those national, uh, the national methodology is already set up and then just adopting that on our land so that it doesn't mean we're recreating the wheel, so. Yeah, I think certainly we've got sort of camera traps out and we're lucky that more trees when they came and planted did a baseline survey. So, uh, but I think there's a real danger of thinking unless you sort of got a baseline survey, don't start because obviously we are in an emergency. I think it was Caroline Lucas, which said, you know, we're going to be the first species which measures our own extinction, you know. So I think there is this danger of getting hung up too much on that sort of thing. Obviously, exceedingly important if you've got the funds and you've got the wherewithal, but it's creating those connections. So we're very lucky around here that we've got sort of local wildlife wardens which are keen to get involved and things like that. So it's tapping into our expertise again rather than, you know, trying to do something new all the time. Great. Yeah, just just growing it. Just, yeah, get started on something and just grow it year on year as much as you can, I would say. Yeah, as, as Kate said, it would be great to have a baseline. I wish someone had taken a baseline 22 years ago at Embercombe, but they didn't. So, um, yeah, we great. just move forward from where we are now. Thank you. Um, Jonathan is asking, what messages land most when you're engaging and connecting with landowners? Is there a message that lands most or is it just depends on the person you're speaking okay, sorry, to? I was, just, I was just reading that. Um, well, Kate and I li uh, just go and talk to people, really, that um, um, we started off with the people nearest us and then we're just going along the ridge. So um, it really depends on the person and what they're doing on their land, I think. Um, but my my piece of advice is is the, the best thing is just go and talk to the landowners and find out what they're interested in. Um, I think it's listening. I think rather than talking, I think people have plenty of people telling them what to do. I think it's actually listening to their story, listening to their story of their land um, and, um, you know, having that sort of you know open relationship and being keen to listen and learn, really. I think one of the greatest things you can do is listen to the story that they've got of their land and, and then go from there. Great. Um, someone has asked... Uh... And this is a question that we get asked quite a lot, I think, around rewilding is do we cut our meadows or leave them alone? Um, had land a couple of years, was previously heavily grazed by horses, ragwort and knapweed, this all coming back. Should we intervene? And I think this question about intervention, whether it's meadows or other things, is something that plays on rewilders' minds quite a lot, I think. Um, and, and when to intervene is quite a hard question to answer. Um, do you have any views on um, what do you do when you're trying to consider to, whether to intervene or not? <laughs> I'm probably a bit more extreme than that um because because my husband's quite extreme um but you know at the end of the day a meadow is a human construct you know and, and that's the thing if you're going to battle it all the time you know if you're trying to keep it as a point in time and that's what you're trying to do with a meadow um I understand meadows are extremely valuable and I've got a lot of respect for the work that that Donna Cox and more meadows team are doing it's fantastic um, but certainly that's not the decision we chose. It's actually to learn to, to love that ragwort and love those thistles. And not only that, look beyond that every year, notice everything else which is coming back alongside that. We, you know, we've got cinnabar moths and it's fabulous to see, you know, and it's just having that that change of aspect, really. Um, and what we find is it flips and flops. You get these really peak years and then you sort of hold fire and then that sort of that goes again and it sort of does this. So, you yeah. know. Yeah. I think as well that, um, I mean, my answer would be, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be a meadow or do you want it to be a dynamic system that's changing? And, um, but also I think looking at the history of that land and if it's been heavily grazed with animals and it's had a lot of impact and it's had a lot of take, you know, people have been taking off that land for a long time then the plants that you're seeing are showing you something. They are showing you something about the quality of that land. Maybe the soil's compacted. Maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's had um, slurry put on it, or maybe it's been cut by for hay regularly, or maybe it's had silage. And so, again, a bit like the woodland is to just just wait and see what. Let that land show you what's going on. Um, and if you don't cut it for a few years 
enjoy that pulse of vegetation and all of the abundance that comes with that it doesn't need to be rare to be special and um and then you know if after a few years you decide that you do want it to be a meadow then you can take action then it, it, you're not going to lose it just over a couple of years so and the ragwort and the dock and the thistles are showing you really that the soil is compacted and that it's had a lot of impact so I think sometimes it's good to just think, OK, this this field or this meadow has had years and years and years of take, 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 take. And I'm just going to let it be for a little bit. And that those plants will help to build the soil, build in some dyna dynamic processes and just, um, yeah, improve the soil health. So just um, be patient and, and let it show you what it wants to do. And then and then once you know how you feel about it, you can decide if you want it to be a meadow or whether you want it to scrub up or maybe a bit of both. Fantastic. Um, we've just about run out of time, so I'm just going to fill in one last really quick question. Um, Mike is has asked, is there a way to connect with you um, and possibly see if there's opportunities to share knowledge with you, um, maybe invite you to his farm in Cornwall? So um, are you happy for us to share contact details afterwards? Yeah, please yeah. do. Yeah. No, if you go to Devon Wildland or, you know, either one of our websites, there's contact details there. But yeah, it'd be great. I always, as, as Laura says, it's always good to go and have a have a look around other people's land. It's exciting to see. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And anyone who's in the webinar who's new to the Rewilding Network and you enjoyed this webinar and want to come to some more of them, uh, please do go on our website. You can sign up for free and that will give you access to our monthly webinars um, and we'll, we'll make this recording available afterwards as well. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Kate and Laura. That was a fantastic webinar. I hope everyone enjoyed it and got a lot from that. We'll share all the links afterwards. Um, but thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your evening. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.